You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 97, the brain behind modern orthodontics. This week on The Dental Guys, we're joined by Dr. Dan German, a published author and highly regarded orthodontic educator, to discuss his journey from mega practice orthodontics to establishing OrthoBrain, a company which is dedicated to using technology to allow general dentists to provide excellent orthodontics in their own practice with the power of an orthodontic specialist backing them up. You're going to love this one this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Des Moines, Iowa this fall 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now to sign up for the next series. Well, welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And as you're going to hear in this episode, uh, which we're pretty excited about, we join uh, Dr. Dan Gurman in Cleveland, where we took uh, a great course, Wes. I mm. mean, really, a truly great course. That course, I think, changed my view on the way that I look at orthodontics in my own practice, as well as just kind of overall. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Gurman is... Uh, it's one man. of the best, and I think we post this on socials, it's one of the best orthodontic <clears throat> courses we've ever taken. That's the best one I've ever taken for sure. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't and know I, that. I, yeah, I don't know that I've taken one better. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, stuff and, out there on like crazy mechanics and you oh know, yeah, crazy there's stuff. There's other cool stuff, but right, this but was I'm, one that you could really take home and use uh, right off and yeah. and really implement into your practice right off uh, uh, in, in a lot of different ways. You hear more about that, but in just a little bit. But I want to talk about something that that uh, that happened. <laughs> When we were in Cleveland, I'd never been to Cleveland before. I don't think Wes had either. And, yeah, I had uh, been. I'd been oh, down. Had, okay. I hadn't eaten there, but oh, I had, like, yeah. whenever I took a Botox training there, I was in Cleveland. Oh, that's right. That's right. It was a Botox one, yeah. So yeah. speaking of eating, I'm glad you brought that up. So Wes, and he's told me it's okay for me to talk about this, so just so you know, I'm not stepping on his on his toes. So he, um, Wes has a thing with with dieting, and and once before... A couple years ago, probably what, three or four years ago. Yeah, 2016. You, you were like, all right, man, I'm going all in and I'm going to lose some serious weight and I've got a plan. And you did it <clears throat> and it was very successful. And you had kind of told me a few weeks ago, um, it's, it's coming again. I'm doing it. It's time. So, yeah, yeah I hurt my knee and I kind of gained some weight back over the last yeah. six to nine Couldn't months. Couldn't exercise as much as you wanted, right? Yeah. Because your and stupid just, knee. And just stupid stuff, you know, you know yeah. how we all get. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm, I, I kind of had an idea of what to expect, <clears throat> but you really don't know what to expect until you, sh you show up in the hotel room and as Wes is unpacking his suitcase, he unpacks a food scale. <laughs> now, when a man unpacks a food scale out of his suitcase, you know, things are about to get really, we really real. We've only and seen you one thing all... worse than that. We've only seen one thing worse than that, and that's a food scale in a restaurant. In now, a I'm restaurant never... weighing we chips will... at a Mexican restaurant. You I've know who you done... are. You know who you are. <laughs> if you're, you're listening, listening to this, you know who you are. <laughs> you know who you are. So, so I what what and I because I, I want to let I'm, let me kind of just tell everybody because I know you, you could tell it, but but you're going to go into 17 minutes of detail like y'all do about your bees and stuff. Up. So just let me just cut through it, and I'm going to let you tell the rest of it. So Wes, what I will just tell you, Wes is doing an HGG plus low calorie diet. That's that's kind of this ramped up thing where the first few weeks it's basically 500 calories a day plus mm -hmm. the HCG. And when we're talking 500 calories, we're talking like no sugar, no starch, uh, no, no fat. fat. I mean nothing. Like you can't even eat broccoli because it's too starchy. So 
Just keep that in mind. All right, keep that in mind, and he's in the midst of this. He's got like four or five days left. We're in Cleveland, a lot of food in Cleveland. <clears throat> so we decide we're going to go down to a nice restaurant. Michael Simon has a couple restaurants down there, which are legit, we had heard. So we go down to one of his restaurants. Now, let me, let me just explain to something, you guys. Wes is a foodie. So am I. We like to eat good food. When we go to restaurants, what do we do? We say, what is the thing I need to get here? I mean, what is the thing I just can't miss? Because I'm only here tonight, and I'll probably never be back. Maybe not. So what do I need to get? So Wes, tell us a little bit about your, your restaurant experience on that diet. What did you eat in that day? And then what happened at the restaurant? Because it was epic. <clears throat> yeah, so that day, I think, you know, I had... Before we left, I went ahead and just maxed out my 500 calories, you know, with uh, a three and a half ounce uh, boneless, skinless chicken tender. And um, I put down um, about 10 asparagus because those are about three calories for seven inch spear. <laughs> uh, all pre cooked by my wonderful wife. You it had packaged all... them in your bag. It was oh, beautiful. Dude, it, you had like a block of let bags. Me just say, right. It was like a little it, cube. It was amazing. You had Hands halibut. Down sirloin oh and i chicken had halibut there. sirloin I just had for the halibut i had um buttered lettuce like a butter lettuce i don't know what you call it some kind yeah. of lettuce we know i know what you're talking about yeah and then tomatoes she had chopped up and put herbs on so you had you had a few three calorie asparagus spears you had three and a half ounces of chicken and then a little piece of the only starch i'm allowed to have on this 500 thing is like a piece of melba toast which is 20 calories one so, piece of melba One toast, like a domino. It's the size and of a domino. And then I had domino. something similar to that at lunch, plus I had two fruits that day, probably an apple and an orange. So and that's and you're tapped out, right? That's it. That's it, man. I left at 5. So what are we talking about? 5.30, So, the, so the server comes to the table, <clears throat> and he's we're ordering stuff. You know, we're getting this and that. Chicuterie board. Getting drinks, yeah. <laughs> I ordered six apps. <laughs> and he's like, so what are you drinking tonight? Well, everybody's ordering their drinks. And he's mm -hmm. like, I'm just on soda water tonight. With lime. I'm here, I'm here for the camaraderie. I'm just here he for like, the camaraderie, he says. He, he, I said that, and he was like, man, I get that. He was like, that's cool. He was like, Yeah, he me. was cool with it. But he see, like, I was still waiting for you to break. I thought there was a possibility just, did you, I mean, tell, did you even think about it for a second? Did you just kind of think, I want, because I got this hanger steak. Oh, I looked really good. I mean, heck, dude, I, I, I actually served food to you guys. You did. You passed around the sides and stuff. You were like yeah. the server at the table. Yeah. But you it totally was, held fast the whole time. I could not believe it. Know, all of the ladies were just looking at like looking at Wesley. They couldn't like, believe it. How you know, is this and you possible? all got the desserts. And here I am, you know, watching the desserts go by. And that was fine. But when you <laughs> don't eat fine. the dessert, when you don't eat it right, when you don't eat it right, I have to instruct. See, I'm that guy. <clears throat> I'm a teacher yeah. at heart. So, you know. I, you were telling I, us what we were doing wrong. Yeah, it's all right. You know, I mean, you know, I'm the, I could get that privilege, you know, since I'm like on soda water. So you have one more day of this 500 calorie thing, right? Yeah, man. One more day. And then day. and then it's finally on the on the downhill. Yeah, it's you know, basically at the, after that, it's just straight up ketosis for about 20 some days. Well, but so tell me, because everybody's going to know, does it work? It works. Hands down. I've done it twice now. You know it. So I know. I mean, I mean know. I'll tell you, I've, I'm, I'm, I've been witness if, to it both times. I have other friends that have done it. I have family members that have done it. Yeah. It, it, it works. People say, well, do you keep the weight off? Um, John, you can testify. Up yeah, until three about, years. Like, it was fall. just until you couldn't really exercise because of your knee yeah. that it even started to change. Yeah. I and mean, that, so, that's impressive. I was impressed. So, I mean, I'll tell you, there's just nothing like traveling with someone on a diet. <laughs> I man. mean, it's And the, traveling with John, oh, it's like really hard. Yeah, because I mean, you, we just try to find like the best to eat. stuff. That taco place, I tell you what, that was that the hardest more, one. That because you know, man, I'm a chip guy. I know the I'm tortilla a chip chips are sitting there, or the guac, and the then I was like, the "What's guac. your best taco?" They had like seventy different tacos on the menu. Ah, I'll nice. tell you, I was impressed Condados. with food in Cleveland. Let me do, yeah, Condado is the name of it. Condado that was yeah. in Beachwood where we stayed, mm -hmm. and then downtown Cleveland. I need to spend some more time there, Wes. I if was you go super take impressed. an ortho brain course, I highly yep. recommend because <clears throat> and and one you should go take an ortho brain course if you're yeah. considering putting orthodontics in your. I practice. think after you hear this episode, you're going to want to take. Yeah, you're going to want to do that. And before we get into that, Bo, that the two restaurants that we would highly recommend in Cleveland, 
mm. is when you stay at the Marriott in Beachwood to take this course. If you if take the course, where, yeah. If you take the course, that taco place, Condado, yeah. um, amazing. Is ex- it's amazing. It's excellent. Skip the rest. Go right to that. Yep. Get it. Yep. And then the, the second place is Lola downtown. Mm-hmm. Um, it Michael, is a Simon. Michael Simon. You need to get reservations ahead. Maybe yep. call maybe a week or so in advance. Maybe a little longer if you have a larger Yeah, it was party. hard to get in there, but it was totally to worth it. And then but, we went to this cool place, Bar 32. Oh, yeah. 32 could, uh, floors up on this Hilton overlooking, overlooking Lake Erie. And you can see the amazing stadium. Drinks. You can see down in the stadium where the Cleveland yeah, Browns. Play. Right. I mean that that was cool. And and I mean we had we were only there for a short time, but I mean every uh, my experience there very very good. Certainly want to go back and spend some more time. But what we're we're excited to bring this episode to you because number one is like I say one of the best courses we've taken. Definitely the best ortho course I've taken. And you know we love people <clears throat> who are in it for the right reasons. Mm. And we don't spend a ton of time on that topic because we're so we're interested in his course and his what he's doing. But I'll just tell you, Dr. German, Dan German is is in it for the right reasons. Um, he spent a lot of time at this course just talking about why you do what you do, what true happiness is, what that's all about, and why doing some of this cool stuff that can yeah be profitable and it can be really fun, but it brings you happiness above other things. Yeah, and that that's what it's about. So hey, I think you're really gonna enjoy too. this. Yeah, because. There's going to be some Geeks Corner featuring some of his <clears throat> articles that he's published over the years that we really thought were valuable that we yeah. didn't know about at, um, until this weekend. And so we'll be we'll be talking about those in Geeks Corners coming up. But uh, stay tuned. And right after a word from our sponsor, you'll hear from Dr. Dan Gurman. This is Justin Goodbrand. Here is today's tip. Making money is fun. Building wealth is great. But remember, you can't take it with you. Faith family, and friends are the most important. Now is the time to take a long, refreshing vacation. Just make sure you couple the vacation with a CE class for your potential tax deductions. For more information about today's topic and other dental-related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, hi there and welcome to another episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And we are here with someone really special, Dr. Dan Gurman. Let me tell you about Dr. Gurman. You probably have heard of him if you've been around for a while because he has been around doing uh, education in orthodontics for a long time. And he's an orthodontist. He's been well-known. For the last 25 years, he's been involved uh, with speaking and education on clinical orthodontics, practice development uh, to orthodontists and GPs. Uh, He's taught kind of everywhere internationally. We were just talking about that before the show, including a huge audience at National Orthodontic Society, Equilibration Society, just kind of everywhere, um, and teaching at Ohio at the Ohio State University, um, and also received the Distinguished Alumni Award uh, at the Ohio State, the only the second time that's ever been uh, bestowed. It's a real honor to have you on the show. Welcome. Welcome hey, to the show. This is terrific, and I'm really grateful to be with you, too. Yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting. And Wes, talk a little bit about how we got connected with with Dan, because it was kind of a neat story. Yeah, it is a neat story. We're at, um, in March of 2019, we were up at the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics, and we uh, uh, were being hosted in a a booth there in the uh, exhibition hall. And we would jump over to the lectures and then come back over and do some podcasting. And um, a a friend of ours introduced us. He said, I got somebody that you're all going to just love, that's Mm -hmm. passionate about dentistry, that just is always trying to take it to the next level. And uh, Jason introduced us uh, to Dr. Dan and German, and we just hit it off. We started, you know, it's funny, too, when you meet somebody, like how you fill each other out, Mm -hmm. and then the conversation just gets rolling, and then, you know, one of us drops, like, some name about, like, some paper that we read, and then I think we asked you about some airway question, and you're like, you guys, uh, what do you guys do, you know? And I'm like, who are you people? Yeah, at first, you know, (laughs) you think, are these guys, like, selling something to me? And, And no, we're just two dentists that have a podcast that want to just, you know, talk a dentistry and talk shop. And so, and we found out that you like to talk dentistry, you like to teach dentistry. Right. And then we found out a little bit more about you, which John told us about, 
which you had an amazing orthodontic practice in Dayton, Ohio, and was able to treat thousands of uh, people and to the highest level. And you introduced technology in your practice. You mm-hmm. were bleeding edge. Um, mm-hmm. You were some of the. You were one of the main innovator, innovators with dolphin technology, um, uh, which is used in orthodontics today. Uh, you were one of the main innovators in 3D tomography, mm-hmm. CT as we call it today, or cone beam tomography today. And um, that helps us and our listeners know a lot because we're what we're going to talk about here is your next steps because you were successful in practice, but you've moved beyond practice. Yeah, because you were practiced for a long time in teaching But then I think it was back in 2016 that you started OrthoBrain. And uh, uh, so uh, we really just want to know a little bit about what you're doing now. What is OrthoBrain? Because we're here getting to actually learn from you about what you're doing and how we could implement orthodontics into our practices, which is something that Wes and I have always talked about. We've done Invisalign for years and years. But, you know, for some reason, orthodontics is a little intimidating to a lot of GPs. And so we're here learning from that. But tell us a little bit about, first of all, just what is OrthoBrain and kind of where did it come from? Um, Tell us the story. So the story is really quite fascinating because it really started prior to the digital revolution. So what would happen is I'd get invited for a speaking gig. So in the late 80s, early 90s, when I first started going out on the road and giving my talks, They were primarily to orthodontists. Mm -hmm. And I'd give a talk to orthodontists. And as I told you in the course, I used to take on really challenging um, cases, cases that maybe other orthodontists didn't even want to treat. Complex perio, ortho, prosto, uh, orthonathic surgery. I think you called yourself the garbage man. The garbage man. Send me the stuff that you don't want to do because it's too hard. (laughs) Right. And, you know, an orthodontics is fun and it's easy. You have... Primarily kids coming in with crooked teeth, especially in the 80s. There weren't that many adults in treatment, and so I would take on Mm -hmm. the adults. Um, And when I presented that type of work to various audiences, I would invariably get contacted by some of the attendees. And they would would take models, alginate impressions, pour them up, wrap them up in in napkins, and send me a a, a Panorex that was probably processed, wet processed, Mm -hmm. analog x-ray from a dark room and they'd fold it in half and put it in a box and they'd ask me to call them and tell them what I think. So I started consulting at that level um, for people who attended my courses. Okay. And it was a lot of fun and it was really, um, it was an honor and honestly probably fed my ego um, a little bit thinking that, uh, you know, the people admired some of the work that I was doing. And I did that throughout the 80s and early 90s, and then I took it to another place, and that's when I started to share the whole idea of how to do orthodontics with the practitioners in Dayton, Ohio. Mm. So in other words, the general dentist that practiced in Dayton, Ohio, um, had occasion to attend some courses. And so I thought hold I would on, hold on. Much. So you're a specialist providing orthodontics in Dayton, and you reached out to general dentists and wanted to teach them how to do what you were doing or some of what you're doing. That's not the typical way things go. No. And, and frankly, what happened is that a few of them contacted me. If you remember back, um, in the early nineties before you were practicing, there were some, there were some hard times economically Mm -hmm. in our, in our profession Mm -hmm. and dentists were scrambling around trying to find out what they could do in order to increase the revenue. And so some of my colleagues, started to uh, go down the path of doing some orthodontics. And I viewed them as colleagues, as I do now, that we're all dentists. Mm -hmm. And there's an abundant amount of work to be done out there. Mm -hmm. And I found that uh, they appreciated the support. Mm -hmm. And as they learned orthodontics, the more orthodontics they knew, the more they diagnosed, and the more orthodontics was performed in their practices. And they didn't do all of the orthodontics. Yeah. They cherry-picked the patients that they wanted to treat, and then the others they would send over to me. So and it's a so win-win. It was yeah. a win-win. Everybody yeah. won. The patients won because they were able to get care, perhaps um, at a more affordable price, in yeah. a place where they were comfortable. And the dentists knew that they were providing good care. Yeah. And they sent me plenty of business. And thank God, I had a very busy practice, so I wasn't scratching around uh, looking for for every possible way to, to, to 
grab and treat every patient that was that was in the community. Mm -hmm. So it it went in that direction. Um, most of the teaching that I was doing in that time was more commercial in the sense that an organization like the African Dental Association would hire me and I would go and I would teach for a few days and I would get paid. And I did that as an advocate for, for some of the um, big manufacturers, mm -hmm. companies like 3M. So I was a, uh, I was a paid advocate. Mm -hmm. um, I used to call them cheerleaders. They called us champions. But basically what we did is we would go out on the circuit. They would arrange talks for mm -hmm. associations, societies, study clubs, and, um, and we would we would give lectures and and they built goodwill. Mm -hmm. so it wasn't mm -hmm. selling product, but it was really teaching orthodontics. Yeah, yeah. I think in a lot of pe in a lot of times uh, the manufacturers, um, you know that that allows you to kind of spread the get your feet wet as far as a lecturer, yeah, and then spread you know your passion, which is orthodontics. So you were and, involved from that side of things, and and did that? So how did that lead you toward what you're doing now? Well, it became. It became important to me to help touch as many lives as possible. Okay. And so the realization came about that the orthodontic work we do profoundly changes lives. Mm. You know, early on in my career, the thought was that orthodontics is elective. And it really is elective, but it's not elective in the sense that it doesn't have an impact on somebody's life. So once we realized that children and adults are bullied much more often when they have crooked teeth, mm -hmm. that they're rated as being less intelligent, less likely to succeed, less likely to be good leaders. All of a sudden, I realized that the impact that we have on lives is so profound that I began to realize that our profession has not done a good job of reaching all of the people that need our care. Yeah. And I started researching it, and I started to look and see what percentage of the population would benefit from orthodontics and what percentage of the population is receiving the orthodontics. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded at how many people there are that need to be treated. And I realized that there aren't enough orthodontists spread out throughout the country to reach all of those people. Mm. I've, according to the Orthodontic Association, the American Association of Orthodontics, only 35% of all the counties in the United States have an orthodontist. Man. 35. So mm. most need. of the counties don't have an orthodontist in the U.S. Mm. Um, and the other place where there's a lot of need is, is in our cities. Mm. Mm. In the urban areas, uh, I've read that 60% of all the children in the city of Detroit have not seen a dentist in the past year. Man, So, so seeing the disparity of, you know, or the access to care be so little, um, you saw fit to be able to retire uh, from private practice per se and uh, pursue what was working, but on more of a grand scale. Exactly. So that you could not only enhance, like, well, if I can teach orthodontist in my community in Dayton, what you're saying is, why can't I teach orthodontist or general dentist, right, globally or right. nationally? And then that's going to even help out other specialists too, just like it helped out you. Exactly. Is that why orthobrain? Yeah, and orthobrain... Um, it took the combination of a lot of different things coming available at the same time. The realization that in an orthodontic practice like mine where we had a large volume, the large volume doesn't mean low quality, by the way. Mm. The two of them are not exclusive. They can go very well together. It's a matter of developing really fine systems. But what I found is that I was able to leverage my time and I was able to train my team in order to deliver the care. Mm -hmm. And so the longer I practiced, the more I was able to delegate to really skilled team members that could provide the clinical services to the same level and oftentimes even better than I could mm. because of the repetition that mm -hmm. they were having doing that all day. And I was able to use my knowledge to diagnose, to treatment plan, to lead a team, to inspire them, to have a vision, to really care for people with the utmost dignity and respect mm -hmm. and really mm -hmm. give that world-class customer service to patients that is so rare in healthcare. Mm. Mm. And so the, the original transformation that I wanted to perform in healthcare was in the way that we care for patients. Mm. You know, we don't treat teeth, we treat people. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I felt that there was a lot of room for improvement. So one of the mis missions in the practice was learn how to care for people. And what happened was that the better we cared for our patients, the bigger our practice got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you know, where we built an army of raving fans mm -hmm. by the exceptional service and care that they treat had. People outside right, the and they'll treat you right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and it turned out to be an incredible marketing plan, which wasn't even by design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we had that desire to reach out to a lot of different people. And that seemed to happen about the same time that the di digital revolution became real. Mm. The digital revolution meaning that I can see people and I can diagnose treatment plan seamlessly from a distance. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be in the room because I've got the benefit of all the imagery right in front of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so no longer do doctors have to send me things in a box. Mm -hmm. We're able to systematize, operationalize the process. So ortho beca ortho brain became a group of very talented and committed, passionate people that basically work around the clock to fulfill this mission of, of transforming the way healthcare is delivered and really reaching uh, a lot more people, solving that access to orthodontics problem. We have those people, but it's all driven by having a collaborative software platform where we can interact with doctors. Mm. So, so tell us then, with that all being said about kind of the groundwork and how it got there, what is OrthoBrain? Tell us about the, you know, what, what, is, what is the company? How does it work? Um, what, what exactly are you training people to do? And then what does, what's the company's role? What's your role in, in facilitating that? Yeah, so I would say a, a profoundly important difference between our company and our service from others that I've seen is that we are not selling a treatment or a product. In other words, there's an aligner vendor, and the aligner vendor finds a way to take whatever malocclusion is out there and use their product. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the only option. So you have some vendors that are, that are really dedicated to braces. You have some vendors that are really dedicated to aligners. Mm. And the treatment plans are, are, have to fit, the treatment has to fit um, the patient's problem. Whatever the problem is, the solution is basically the same. We took a different approach, and that is that we want to care for the patients in the way that the dentist feels is most appropriate or the way that is best suited for the patient based on the problems they present with. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we talk about and we emphasize in our course is which treatment modality is going to be best for the patient. Are they aligners, braces, expanders, a combination of the above? Okay. So with OrthoBrain, um, doctors send us photographs, x-rays, and models. Mm-hmm. They give us a script. They tell us what's going on with the patient. We need some clinical findings. And based on that, we can create a diagnosis, a problem list, a prognosis that goes with each one of the problems that we identify, narrow it down to some objectives, and then we come up with a treatment plan and we instruct the dental team, not just the dentist, mm -hmm. but the dental team on exactly what they're supposed to do at each of the appointments. So they have a document to follow, a recipe to follow in order to end up with a great outcome mm. um, with that. So that's what OrthoBrain does from a mechanical standpoint in terms of, of diagnosing and treatment planning. We take it a step further, and that is if a doctor wants to use braces and they are receptive to using the ready-to-bond braces tray, then we create the ready-to-bond braces tray for them. And so the dentist will receive the diagnosis, the treatment plan, and they'll also receive the braces trays that are ready to bond along with arch wires that are in packages that tell them which wire goes in first. So they're labeled wire number one, wire number two, wire number three. And uh, if it's for aligners, then we'll do the clean check or we'll do the clear correct setup or any of the different vendors that you want to work with yep. in order because we're agnostic in terms of of where the product comes from. The one product that comes from us um, are, the, are the braces. The braces are orthobrain braces, but the aligner companies, we will work with, with any of the aligner companies, and the same thing with the arch development expansion type appliances. So mm -hmm. that's one component of the company, and that's primarily what people focus on. The other part is an educational arm, and that's what you're attending right now is a two-day hands-on seminar mm -hmm. to get people... Um, uh, the basic foundational knowledge that they need in order to have some diagnostic skills when it comes to orthodontics, mm -hmm. understanding timing of treatment for children, mm -hmm. what the barriers are 
for, for orthodontics, what you can accomplish, what you can't accomplish, what is, what is a problem that is better treated by an orthodontist. We help, we help educate dentists in that regard. Um, and we also provide the instruments and the supplies. I mean, mm. we're not intended to be an instrument and supply company. You know, we're, we're not the least expensive mm-hmm. way to, to get your instruments, but we take that disruptive process out of the hands of the dental practice. Yeah. When it comes to procuring all of the instruments and the supplies, we already have all that. We've picked out all the stuff that works. Yeah. We put it in a box and we send it to you and you don't have to waste your time mm-hmm. sourcing all those well, things. Well, and you, you know, you talked a lot in the beginning of this about systems, you know, and you've talked a lot about that throughout the day today. Right. And that's one thing I think I've been hearing over and over again is you, you've, you developed systems along with your team, not just right. you, but along with your team and years of experience. And it sounds like this is, this is really a systematic way to be able to diagnose treatment plan and provide this care. And if you want uh, to have it down to you send the instruments that will be needed, you guys do that. If you right. want to just have you be involved in the diagnosis and treatment planning, you'll, you can do that. If you want to be really, uh, you know, hands off, you can, you, you know, you can just give advice and it sounds like it's kind of a, a whatever the practitioner wants in terms of how involved uh, you get with the, the process you, you get, that's a very interesting approach because it, yeah. it sounds like you can really take it any direction that this practitioner wants, yeah, the product, so the type, all these things. This is where the genius from start is in, in, in what we're saying here is John and I've talked about how orthodontics and where is it going, you mm-hmm. know, and how do we have access to care. And John, you were talking about this morning even uh, something you were listening to about what's going to happen with orthodontics mm-hmm. because we see – things that are happening like Smile Direct Club mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. things like, you know, show up at the mall and you you have this consumerism way of receiving straight teeth. And we're starting to see that in our practices. And there's a lot of questions being raised about who's supervising that and who's responsible for mm-hmm. retention and really the treatment and diagnosing of that. But what I see this for is I see it very similar to what you said this morning is whenever you have a medical doctor, There's more physicians, like family physicians, and more nurse practitioners than there are radiologists or internal medicine specialists, let's just say specialists. And imagine being able to identify, diagnose, and treatment plan what needs to be done to take care of this case. Right. And in a rural environment, man, it's powerful to be able to have an orthodontist like basically in your ear, mm-hmm. essentially right behind you at the chair. Let me send you some photos, Doc, Dr. German, and let me show you what I'm seeing today. And yes, that's looking great. Uh, why don't you make these? I'm seeing some things here. I'd like to see that. Make those corrections and follow up in the appointed time. That, that's how detailed this kind of consulting right, service could be. Right, and talk about be. confidence building right. for so somebody and, and who's that helps, not that as confident. That helps that access to care, but it right. also helps that budding clinician or a clinician. It doesn't have to be budding. It could be any age clinician. Like, help a patient out and have that access to care that we don't have. Not only that, is like, you know, in, in big cities like you've talked about, there's a there's not as great access to care as we might think mm-hmm. to good orthodontics. And so I think what a what this is, is this could be somewhat the future of orthodontics and how we help people like, you know, John and I who want to help as many people as we can. We're not trying to be a specialist, and that's not what you're trying to say here, is that we're trying to um, extend services that we feel like they're in line with our comfort level and things like that. Right, right. And I think that that comes back to, though, the first time that you mentioned Mm. – I'm going to start doing orthodontics in my general practice. Mm -hmm. There's certain immediate red flags that start to go up for some people. They say, oh, general dentist, you shouldn't be doing orthodontics or, or there's concerns about that. And you talked a lot today about why GPs should be doing orthodontics and some of the the things that uh, keep them from doing it and some of the reasons why they should talk a little bit about that, about why that that's, you kind of are passionate about that. Yep. Um, Well, As somebody who consulted and advised orthodontists for many, many years, I understand what the um, limitations are in an orthodontic practice. Mm. And a few of them include hygiene perio. Mm. Orthodontists traditionally don't have a hygienist, and some don't 
use a perio probe um, before mm -hmm. treating their patients or during treatment. Uh, me being one of them, I practiced for 23 years without regularly use, using a perio probe. So our supervision of hygiene and perio has been inadequate. Mm -hmm. We can solve that. Orthodontists can get better at that. I think that's the biggest frustration with, with hygienists today is they come in and they're like, this kid, man, he almost needs to be taken out of braces. Right. And it's not the call you want to get. No. You know? It's like, you need to take this kid out of braces. And I've had to do that a couple times over my career, and I feel almost like bad. For calling my orthodontist because I'm telling them what to do. Right. But if this you know? was done in a GP office setting, you've got support. You've got a system there right. where you know this person's getting education. They're getting hygiene assisting throughout the treatment time. Is what right. you're saying? They just they're they're more supervised. Right. Um, you also have an advantage. One of the one of the things that a general practice is able to offer that an orthodontist just practically can't is long-term follow-up. Mm. So when you have a patient in your practice that's going through orthodontics, not only do they have the benefit of a hygiene department in-house and folks that are really skilled at, at supervising perio uh, considerations, you also have the ability to follow the patient over a lifetime. Mm. So you're going to see the patient at six-month intervals for their, for their uh, hygiene appointments and a perfect time for you to be able to weave in the orthodontic retention supervision. Yeah. And orthodontists can't do that from a practical standpoint. You know, I treated in the tens of thousands of patients in my career. I couldn't possibly see tens of thousands so of patients every so many right. months. So I, in an orthodontic dream world, you would want, after you have that initial nine and 10 month follow-up in your traditional orthodontic practice, the orthodontist gives you the golden ticket, you're done, see ya, and you never see him again. And that's great to say bye because you have to say goodbye as a specialist. Right. But as a GP, you re retain that patient maybe for 20, 30 years sometimes, okay? So what's the ultimate goal mm. of monitoring? So with monitoring, I'll, patients oftentimes will have a hiccup with their retainers. Mm. Everything's going fine. They go on a cruise. On the cruise, they don't wear the retainer for a couple nights. A tooth shifts a tiny bit. Then the retainer doesn't fit as well as it used to fit. So then the tooth shifts a little bit more. Well, then they put the retainer in, and it hurts. So they leave it out for a couple of days. Then the tooth moves more. They forget about it. We've all Next thing it. you know, you have yeah. crooked teeth. 15% of my adults were retreatments. They were people that might have worn braces as children in my practice that came back as adults. And it really gave me no joy to have to treat somebody a second time. Um, so you're able to supervise the retention. And as soon as something doesn't seem quite right, and if you can train your patients to come in with their retainers so that you can supervise their retainers, why then you're going to help avoid all these retreatments. And then you think of the possible consequences of orthodontics um, induced gum problems, which mm. are, look, typically the orthodontist is not going to create those types of side effects. So the gum recession may occur because or despite the orthodontics, we don't know. But either way, there's a set of eyes on it. And so um, it can happen from an occlusal standpoint as well, where all of a sudden you're seeing attrition, mm -hmm. interferences, jaw problems, whatever it may be, you have the ability to pick up on that and you can revise the retention protocol that the patient is in. Yeah. For example, if they're wearing one of those um, clear vacuum form retainers, mm. you might come to the conclusion like, wow, if their jaw's bothering them, they're bruxing, maybe that's not the right retainer for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we get rid of the plastic, they'll quit grinding. See it all the time. Just put a bonded lingual retainer in yeah, and right. see what happens. Well, right. if that doesn't work, you can leave the bonded lingual retainer in and you can make them a full coverage custom-made orthotic. Sure. And you, you're on it. And and the other thing is, is in, in support of the orthodontist, we tend to, to, to have a fee that includes anything and everything we do in our office. Mm. Yep. And so doing additional services after we complete the orthodontics, right. there's no it's remuneration it's and it. it's, it's awkward tough. asking people for money. Right. Especially right. if you treated multiple members of the family, you know, somebody looks at it and you say, wow, you treated three of my children. We paid you $7,000 for each child. I've given you $21,000 and you want to charge me what, $120 to make a different retainer? Right. Doc, right. can you take care of my kid? Right. Well, of course you will. Right? Yes, yes. So um, uh, when you think about it, 
the incentives for orthodontists to do that type of work really aren't there. And even if we were to collect that $120, that meter is going awfully slow compared right. to the way yeah. it goes when you're putting a set of braces on or a set of aligners. It's not that orthodontists are greedy. It's just that the model doesn't support long-term follow-up. Sure. And the only solution that I've ever come up with, and I really haven't shared it, so this is... this is uh, <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, oh, it's a scoop. Here first. It's a scoop. Here. Is <laughs> that there could be some opportunity for what I call co-management between the specialist mm. and the general practitioner yeah so that that the hand that there's some sort of handoff and it would work really well with you too because now that you're you know you've been doing orthodontics with the liners for a while you're you're looking at incorporating some additional orthodontics so your your knowledge base is there that you would be able to help with supervision mm. of patients that were treated elsewhere right? yeah. you know by an orthodontic specialist and and maybe find some way to to to, yeah, to work manage those problems. You well, know, and, colleagues. I, and I think too, you know, that you, you mentioned that earlier today, as we were hearing what you were you were lecturing on, um, just being able to perfect things. Uh, you know, when we're dealing with some of these very intricate little restorative demands that we have as a restorative dentist with say implant spacing, Congenitally or missing tooth spacing, or <laughs> right, or laterals that are missing and and we're um, the going peg through these almost that you can't get sometimes right, right? endless appointments of back and forth and back and forth. And and I know that the orthodontists are taught the size that teeth need to be. Uh, <laughs> are are but, they? But sometimes, I'll tell you, I <laughs> If you're I watching don't, this on YouTube right now, Dan's eyes yeah, are like as big as yeah, quarters. Sometimes <laughs> I don't know if they, if they are taught that. Be, and I don't mean that because, I mean, I love my orthodontists, but sometimes I'm going... <laughs> Guys, don't you know how big a lateral is supposed to be? But I, then I'm realizing today, too, there's some challenges with some of the mechanics of these appliances. So it's not, as I'm being educated more, I'm learning that being able to accomplish this treatment by one person with control over these factors um, allows for you to have the ability to, to maybe even have better outcomes in certain cases, not all, not, you know, and again, not to, not that we don't want to use our specialists, but if you have a case where you know exactly what you need from a restorative standpoint, the ability to control and fine tune these movements, I mean, I could see the benefit from my standpoint and the patient's standpoint of not ping ponging back and forth between the offices because right. man, that's, a, that's, that's trouble sometimes. Right. You have the skill set as the restorative dentist to know when you're finished with the orthodontics. Yeah. If you're going to put porcelain on the front of teeth, you know when you've corrected enough of the rotation so that there's minimized mm -hmm. enamel reduction. <clears throat> Maybe you can even use some feldspar. Um, mm -hmm. Nice. Look <laughs> that, at you pulling out listen, the feldspar. Whoa. This we just talked about feldspar You can tell he's ceramic. been to the <laughs> fixed pros meeting before. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you are an, you are an equilibration society, actually, like – past speaker too but you're I mean, so right yeah. that, that you know there are times when it is a great example you know i actually would rather you not bring the tooth out any further because now i i can use my the ideal material i don't have to cut yeah, them away, as much, cut it away as much and, and the orthodontist isn't really supposed to know that they're not supposed to know precisely how much reduction we need for the material we're using and so again having that control I'm starting to see the the real benefit of that. So so uh, just to change the subject a little bit, because those are some of the benefits, what do you think are the main fears, having taught a ton of people over the years, right. what are some of the main fears or barriers that general practitioners have about orthodontics that kind of keeps them from getting involved with mm, it? Good question. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think that a, a healthy respect for doing the orthodontics, I call it an awe. You ought to have some awe. Mm -hmm. Really realize that what you're doing is important and can have big ramifications if it isn't done properly. Um, I think it's a sign of intelligence to have that sort of retraction when you consider it at first, because I'm not aware of dental schools that are teaching dental students how to do orthodontics. Right. So if you look at the reality of the situation, if you don't have the knowledge base, you haven't been taught you don't know the fundamentals, and you don't have the benefit of a preceptor, a mentor, um, or doing in some sort of apprenticeship where there's somebody who's who's there with you as you're going through it while you're learning. You ought to have a little bit of concern, mm -hmm. and I think that that the vendors um, are overselling the simplicity and the ease of doing the care. Say that. Say that one more time. <laughs> yeah. Say they're that, doing what now? Say that one more time. <laughs> overselling the ease and simplicity. Mm. 
Orthodontics it's hard, isn't it? Orthodontics is like so many other projects in life. It's very easy to start, yeah. and it's really hard to do excellent <laughs> That's work. You, you taught us right something there. today. You word. taught us something today was about finishing. You know, to me, John, it's not just about the start. Yeah, it seems like it's more about the finish. Well, that, and this is the know? case, you know. And again, this is the classic sales throughout the universe forever. <laughs> is we want things to seem easy because that sells. And and truth be told. Uh, in dentistry, um, we've had a, a, a really, I don't know, there's a little bit of a shift in this. You know, I think years and years, years ago, when I talked to really the quote-unquote old-timers that had been around for a very long time, it really wasn't, uh, you're not that guy. No, no you're, you're not, not quite guy, there yet. Dan, no. You'll be there one day. But, uh, <laughs> but, you're, but you know, you hear about that there used to be maybe more of a respect for the difficulty of, of some of these really complex things that we do. And, you know, you had nathological societies and you had the you know, society. equilibration yeah, society. And these were people that really took great pride in doing things really the hard way. And they really, like, almost it was a proving of what you knew and, and, and knowing the literature. And, and, and now I'm not saying that that's not, doesn't happen, but it seems like that's become more rare and there's a little bit more of a, well, let me just show you the easy way to do things. And that kind of discounts really the, the amount of knowledge that you do have to have. And that's where, you know, as a, as a G, as GP, you may not have those fundamentals, so you need to learn that. And you need to then have someone in your back pocket, maybe, who, um, whether that is an apprenticeship with someone or whether that is orthobrain, that you can rely on because right. we don't know enough. And it sounds like that's what's kept a lot of GPs out of that world. Yeah. And so it, it works both ways. They're, the GPs oftentimes will have the intelligence to realize that they have um, conscious incompetence. Mm. Conscious incompetence. Mm. That's means a good, that's a good I know that I don't understand that. Yeah. And I have that about a lot of topics. Sure, that's you know. healthy. My, my expertise is very, very narrow. On the other hand, you have something called unconscious incompetence. Mm. Unconscious incompetence means that you have total happiness because you don't even know that you don't know. It's called incompetent bliss. <laughs> right. Like, of course you're happy. You have no idea right. that you don't know what you're don't doing. Know what you don't and here's know. where it happens. Some people think that if you figure out how to glue braces on the teeth, that you know how to do orthodontics. Mm. Right. And so with the advent of the aligner, you eliminated that complex procedure. Yes. Right? And so now putting braces on is, is opening a box and handing a, 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 a tray to a patient. Say, slide that on your teeth. Right. Well, now I know how to do orthodontics. And, and look, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. I mean, it's, that isn't the orthodontics. That's the part that we, we, we delegate so many of those clinical procedures. And so the incompetent bliss sees it as, well, if I can figure out how to put orthodontic appliances, then I know how to do orthodontics. And then on the other side of it, where you have conscious incompetence, that's like, wow, I really don't know what I'm doing. Why don't I get some help before I, I endeavor into, into a new arena? And I totally get what you're saying because it's almost like the day that you start Invisalign, and I'm not any clear aligner therapy, okay? Any type of therapy like that because you have this um, incompetent confidence that, well, you know, it's the aligners, it's Invisalign's deal here. I'm just delivering you what's moving your teeth, mm -hmm. you know, and I looked at this and I feel like that this is looking good and, you know, I'm feeling okay about it because ultimately it's not me. It's not Wes Mullins that's straightening your teeth. It's Invisalign or clear aligner therapy mm -hmm. that's doing this. And so they feel a little better about doing it, right? Versus exactly. maybe knowing, is that what you're saying? Versus maybe knowing a little bit more, maybe knowing a lot more mm -hmm. and doing the education and getting, finding out some stuff. Right. Yeah. And I think Absolutely. that's great that you're doing it that way, that you're, that you're looking at it from a standpoint of, we're not just going to provide you a product, a, a, you know, here, here's the product that you need and this will allow you to Yeah, because if you do see your reports that you get whenever you do anything, just your consulting report. Yes. It's impressive. Yeah. Thank you. It's yeah. The, one of the most impressive things I've seen. Like I get a great report from my orthodontist and this is, this is rivaling his report if he's listening to this right now, <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's, his reports are 
to the nth degree and very good. And John knows them yeah. as well because John uses him for occasional special issues. So what? So what has been the response to OrthoBrain? Tell us a little bit about what are people saying? Uh, your clients, you know, what are some of the responses you're getting? How is this changing? Is this accomplishing some of the goals that you had set out when you began the company? Yeah, the the response is overwhelming. Mm. I mean, the dentists who have engaged and really done a lot of work, mm. they flatten the learning curve out by doing it. Mm. It's not the kind of thing where you want to dabble and then gradually try and figure out how to do it. You really need to flatten the learning curve by actually doing it and implementing systems, right? Yeah. And you get good at it by doing it. The doctors are thrilled. I have... Um, I tried to predict which demographic was going to find it most appealing, mm -hmm. and I figured it'd be uh, the young whippersnappers. Mm -hmm. Young whippersnappers, meaning folks who really know how to work with technology. Yeah. You know, the dental practitioners that, are, that grew up with computers and that they'd find it easy for interacting yeah, in that's the what digital I would think world. Too, yeah. And the guys who love it are also the folks that are my age. Really? They are the biggest raving fans hmm. because. Think of it. When you get to be, uh, look, I'm not 60, but um, my age group, guys who've been practicing, practicing the number of years I have, they start to get a little bit worn out. Well, say what you said at lunch today. I thought it was perfect about your body and, and dentistry mm. itself. It De was perfect. Yeah. Dentistry is hard work. Mm. And dentistry eventually will break you. Yeah. Mm. It will break you because eventually the occupational hazard of bending over and leaning and the positional problems that you have, the dentist your pump. hands, mm -hmm. you're just, it's, it's hard work. And you can only do it for so many years, no matter how passionate you are, eventually your body gives out, everybody's vision changes. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it's a tough road. Orthodontics, we don't have that problem. Mm. If you're delegating, then you have young people that are putting wires in and taking the wires out while you're using your mind yeah. you know, to help direct you the pay care. You what you know. Exactly. And so I have a whole group of doctors, and I think I showed you some of their cases. I said, that guy is in his 60s. He loves it because he loves the idea of transitioning into a practice that is not so heavily dependent on him on the bending physical. over and using it's the drill. It's not a labor the anymore. It's more of a service of his knowledge. Yeah. And he feels more like a conductor in yeah. the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and really cool. all the visits with the patients are pleasant. He has sure. all these patients that are thrilled with the smiles that they have. Now, if you think about it, the mature dentists also tend to have a mature practice. Sure. Mm. And so they're opening the door for all these adults who have missed out on the benefit of orthodontics. Yeah. So we have, we have just about every demographic you can think of. The one that caught me off guard are my contemporaries. Interesting. And they're building the value in their practices so that when they do get to the point where they want to sell their practices, the asset is worth so much more because of the, of the revenue. Yeah. And that, that system increases. that's now in place where someone can come in and again, having the right knowledge is all that's required. Right. It's not necessarily having, uh, you know, 10 years of experience do repeating a certain thing with your hand. It's, it's having knowledge that, that really is what it's allowing you to do. And that's a, from a business standpoint, that's what we all want to buy is right. a business that that in a way doesn't depend as much on on our physical skills because those things do change and so yeah i could see where that that would be that would create a more valuable business i want to want to change gears just a little bit because we we when we first met you we we talked a lot about the company as well and obviously you know we wanted to get involved with that uh, but we also talked a little bit about just some some other topics in orthodontics and some things that you know listeners of ours I've uh, listened to the show over the last few years. They know that we've been, you know, really interested in how our practices have been affected by new technology. And, and before you do that, yeah, John, yeah, yeah. as we're listening to this right now, I think as we go into this next segment, yeah. um, I want to I want to just break this up just a little bit yeah. for us and um, take just a minute and thank Dan for coming on, yeah. you know, because uh, this is great. And if you're listening to this show right now mm -hmm. um, and you want to find out more about what we were just talking about, you need to head over to OrthoBrain mm -hmm. and tell us a little bit how they can find yeah, out great. a little bit more about how to come take a class. You know, it's a two-day course. It's intense. Like, you don't start at 8 and get done at 3.30. Mm. You start at 8. You work a little bit through lunch, right? Yeah. You have a lunchtime right. meeting, and you finish up 4.35 o'clock, 
and you feel like you've done a day's work, and that's two days in a row. So tell us a little bit about how people can find out a little bit more about OrthoBrain, and then what we're going to do is we're going to close out this show, and then next show mm-hmm, we're mm-hmm. going to come back and we're going to talk about some high-level stuff with Dan. Yep. Stuff that you guys want to know about. Should orthodontist be utilizing cone beam tomography as a part of their diagnosis and treatment planning? We're going to ask Dan that and so much more. Yeah. But Dan, tell us a little bit about how people can find out about OrthoBrain. The easiest way to find out about us is to go to orthobrain.com. Go to our website. You'll get some good foundational knowledge about what the company uh, is and, and how to interact with us. You can find out about our courses. Uh, we have the two-day courses uh, scheduled out oh, for the next year. And uh, you can find out about our services there. And I think if you want to chat with us on our website, you can make an appointment to speak with me directly. So you can, you know, we're a technology company. Yeah, you don't have awesome. to, you yeah. don't have to call. You can go on our site and make an appointment right in my calendar so that we can chat about it. And is the is the course uh, like a prerequisite to be being involved with uh, OrthoBrain? Is that kind of the way that people enter into kind of your your world through that? You know, you would think that you would have to take our course in order to interact with us, but that is not the case. Okay. I appreciate that there are many dentists who have already taken a lot of education. And I think our biggest, our single biggest submitting doctor has been doing orthodontics for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And once he found OrthoBrain, uh, he started using us for all of his orthodontics. And he already had a knowledge base. He didn't need to come to the course. In fact, I would love for him to be one of our faculty members. I don't know how, how the two of you feel about having a general practitioner be part of the educational program. Um, but I think the, that's great. The guys, well, he, I have dentists that do amazing work. I know you've seen some of their work where you can't distinguish the difference between their work and, and my work. Yeah, that's awesome. They're amazing. Yeah. Well, that's great to know. And then, like you say, I mean, people need to go and learn about as And as much, and I, and I like the fact, again, that you are, as much as people want you to help and get involved, that, that you're accessible for that. And there's a lot of ways to get involved with OrthoBrain and to kind of use what you guys have to, to help people get over some of those barriers and those, those things that are keeping them from uh, going into that next level. And even if you are a, a GP like Wes and I have been who's been doing just clear aligner therapy and just wants assistance with just that and doesn't want to get involved with brackets and wires, you're still a little nervous about that. Well, I think you can help them to choose the right cases, know what when, what, when to refer, uh, what to watch out for. How and, to implement it, how to yeah. get your team involved. Right. I mean, our, these team, are, our teams are here this week. Right. These are know? things that I think uh, you know are, are, are needed and, and take a lot of the stress away from the day. And you well, know, there's different reasons to get into any procedure, but I think that one of the things that we see that going on here is you're, you're trying to, to do it the right way. Well, thanks, Dan, again for yeah. coming on the show. And if you're listening to us right now and you need to send us a message, have on over to the dental guys at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you want to get in touch with Dan there, go to uh, orthobrain.com and send him a message, make an appointment to talk to Dan, That's right. which I think would be well worth your time if you're considering taking his course just to kind of get an insight of what, what he could do to help maybe take your practice to the next level. So for Dan, John, I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys. <laughs>